Do you know the fountain? His name is Christ Jesus. Put your hands together. Give him praise in this house. Have you enjoyed this choir tonight? Praise the name of the Lord. God is good. His mercy endures forever. Don't just panic and give him praise. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. If you are saved tonight, it is only by the grace of God and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He is the spring, the fountain of living waters. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I feel the presence of the Lord in this place. I said, I feel the presence of the Lord. You know, when we saturate an atmosphere with praise, Scripture says that He inhabits the praises of His people. So in the midst of sincere praise, in the midst of sincere praise to Him, you'll find His presence. is comely means that it looks good on the upright and I'll tell you what I've never seen you look as good as you do right now amen in the midst of praise thank you Lord thank you Lord I want you to stand to your feet one more time if you can I've been honored to serve with Rudell Bloomfield State Council and other committees and different things in my tenure here as pastor. If I'm not mistaken, he's been at his church 30, 38 years, one church. Doing a phenomenal job. Has a Christian school top notch for the state. So many programs and ministries that have been launched under his visionary leadership over the years. And I'm honored that the man as esteemed and as busy as he is, that he would consider coming to Madison, West Virginia to bring us a word from the Lord. I've been looking forward to this. Moment. Praise God, I am. I want you to just come right now. Give him a great Boone County welcome as he comes. You just obey the Lord, my brother. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Please, please be seated. Praise God. Well, I'm not a stranger, and many of you, some of you, I know, and um, brought to one couple that uh, are Boone County natives, Steve and Gay Price, so they know a little bit about Boone County. And, uh, and my wife is here. Stand up, honey. She's from Lens Creek. Hern Shoulder, the other side of Lens, on the, on, over the mountain. You know where that is. And uh, my brother-in-law back there, Mac, her big brother, and Brenda, and Tammy, and Scotty, I know. So uh, I know some people. Uh, that, and uh, for, for many years, I, used, I, I pastored. My first church was in Verdonville, Mud Fork. Anybody know where Mud Fork is in Logan County? And I used to come by here all the time. And we'd come over to her parents lived over at Hernshaw, so we'd come by here all the time and driven by this many, many times. And uh, I pastored over there for three and a half years and went to Ravenswood up in Jackson County for six years and went to Oak Hill and been there ever since. But I found my wife over there at Hernshaw and we got married in March will be 48 years ago. She's done well to stay with me 48 years. But uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm just thankful for the privilege of being here. And I'm so thankful for what I see happening here, Brother Dingus. Uh, I know that you're uh, from this area. And, and it's, it's rare for someone in their own area to start a church or do a, build a church and, 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 and do what's being done here. And so I really appreciate his work. And uh, being with him in, in, in meetings where we have to make decisions and talk church strategy and talk about the work of the Lord I know the wisdom that he has 
and I know the uh, understanding that he has to the work of the Lord and that he's, he, he is a gift to you. You know that, don't you? He's a gift to you. And uh, I know you treat him well, and I hope you just keep right on treating him well because he deserves it. And uh, I tell you, as a pastor, you, you need all the support you can get. You need people to trust you and to, uh, uh, to listen to you and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, endure you at times when you get these big harebrained ideas and you get these big visions that are impossible, you know. Uh, can I tell you something about vision? If God gives you a vision, it'll be so big you can't do it. If it's a God vision, it's, it's something bigger than you, and it will require the Lord to make it happen. And uh, so God gives you a pastor and gives him a vision, and I know he has a tremendous vision for right here, and you, 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 uh, you help him, and you support him, and God will, you, you'll reap the benefits of it, and the, the area will reap the benefits of it. I have so many things to say, I don't know which way to go. So I've got to figure out which direction I'm going to go tonight. I know the theme that the Lord's given me. In fact, in fact, I'm stuck on it. And I did a series of messages at our own church and uh, moved on to something else. Now I'm going back to it again. I'm going to do some more teaching because I think that right now we need revival. And I'm going to talk to you about can revival still come? When I watch the news, now this is an introduction. I'll read you a scripture in just a minute, but this is, I, w I want to set the stage for it. When I watch the news and I hear all the bad things that are happening and I hear all the threats that are out there, that uh, all the possibilities of what's going to take place in the next few months and very likely this year, there's going to be tremendous change take place in our country. And uh, America is in a... Uh, is in a battle and a spiritual struggle right now. It's not, it's not just politics. We're divided politically, but that's not the worst thing. We're in a, we're in a tremendously uh, uh, serious struggle spiritually in this country because we are here for a purpose, and we're about to miss that purpose. And if we do, we have no reason to continue existing. And I don't know about you, but I can't imagine what the world would be like without the United States of America. Who's going to feed the poor and who's going to fight for liberty and freedom? Who's going to help those who are oppressed and those who are in bondage if we're not here? So we, we, we're really in a tremendous struggle and we need to find out what God wants to do and find out what God's doing and get on His side. Don't pray for God to be on your side. Find out what God's doing and be on His side. You know, when... Um, when was it uh, Joshua uh, met the man at night? He was uh, out there in prayer before he was going out the next day and lead the people of Israel into the promised land. He met this man, tall, strong, stalwart man, and he asked him, are you on the Lord's side? And he said, I am the Lord. So it's not a matter of if I'm on the Lord's side, are you on my side? That's what he was saying. He was, a man, he was God coming down to meet with Joshua. So we need to meet God, and that's what revival is. Yeah. It's bringing God down. Let me read you a description of something, and i got so many things that I have to pick and choose what I try to give to you tonight because it would take me three or four nights to do all of it, and you don't have three or four nights, and so I'll just have to try to condense it. But I want to read you this. We talk about revival, and we think in terms of evangelism. I evangelized for years, and I remember... Uh, preaching two-week revival. You might remember two two-week revivals. I preached a five-week revival, nonstop, no rest nights. I mean, five weeks every night. Uh, hundreds, uh, dozens of people says, uh, dozens of people saved, uh, and that was. That, it, it, but we think about revival as evangelism, but revival is reviving, resuscitating, restoring something that used to be alive. So we can't start revival in Charleston or in Washington, D.C. among people who don't know God. Revival is what happens when God visits us. When we align ourselves with God and His purpose and God starts doing in us and through us what He wants to do, that's when revival really takes place. The result of that will be uh, evangelism. Souls will be saved and people come to the kingdom of God. But until we get right with God... And we get ourselves aligned with God and His purpose, there will not be evangelism. That is the result of revival when it really truly comes. I want to go to Psalm 85. 
and read you some verses. And, and I'll, I'll give you a little information about this psalm when I get into the message just a little bit. I want to read you these verses, uh, six verses of it. It is written, for, uh, it is written by, uh, to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. And I'll tell you who those guys are and why it's important what they're saying. He says, Lord, you have been favorable to our land or to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins. Selah, which is like amen. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God, of our salvation and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Look at verse 6. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Now, uh, this the psalmist is thinking about the spiritual history of Israel. This nation of Israel was one that uh, is, has a long history of, uh, of following God and being blessed and then drifting away from God and forgetting His promises and violating His covenant, breaking His law, being unfaithful to the Lord, uh, taking other gods into their lives until God has to forsake them, turn His back on them, or leave them into the hands of their adversaries. So Israel is, uh, if, you, if you want to get uh, just one example, if you look at the book of Judges, in the book of Judges, there's a, just a series of Israel uh, does uh, wrong in the eyes of the Lord and sins and, and their enemies come in and take them over and take them into captivity and bondage and, and they get uh, either carried away or they are oppressing, they're oppressed by their enemies and their crops are taken every time they till their fields and they have nothing to feed their own people and they cry unto the Lord and the Lord raises up somebody among them who's the deliverer and a judge and they turn to the Lord and the Lord delivers them and and as long as that ruler, that righteous man governs them, they, they do well and they, they're the blessed of God and then he dies and they go back to the same old cycle over and over again. So they're thinking of the history of Israel. They're remembering what had happened to them in the past. In fact, they even say in here, you have been favorable to your land. They even say, you have delivered us. You have set us free. You have, you have taken away our sin. But here they are in a dilemma again. And they're crying, Lord, will you not revive us again? And I'm telling you, it reminds me of the nation where we are today. Because America is similar to Israel in that we have enjoyed the blessing. How, how many of you know, I, I don't know how many of you have traveled abroad. I haven't traveled a whole lot, but I've gone to a few places. And I want to tell you something. The world doesn't have what we have. And the world doesn't live the way we live. There has never been a nation like the United States of America in history. There's never been a land so blessed as this land is blessed. We have in this country, in this continent, this part of the continent that we occupy, we have an abundance of resources and things that, that many parts of the world don't have. They say you can tell the character of a country by which way the traffic flows when the doors are opened or in the gates are opened. We're having to put up walls to keep people out. And many places they have to put up walls to keep their people in so they won't leave. And that ought to tell you something about that country. We have been blessed greatly of the Lord. And I am be, I'm convinced. And I'm going to show you to you tonight. And if I don't get anywhere else, I want, to, I want you to see that God raised up the United States of America for a purpose. And if we will fulfill that purpose, God will restore us, revive us, and bring us back to a place of blessing where we have been in the past. But if we miss that purpose, we have no reason to continue on as we are. Yeah. Say with me now and follow me because I'm going to give you some truth. Now when, when, when uh, God was angry at Israel because they had worshipped the golden calf while Moses was on the mountain receiving the law of God, and God was so angry that he was about to cut them off. In fact, he said to Moses, step aside, and I will go ahead and do away with this generation, and I'll raise up a generation out of you. And he could have done it and, and been faithful to his covenant with Abraham because Moses was the descendant of Abraham. In other words, he said, I'm going to start over. I'll just erase this nation and start with you, and we'll go again. And Moses withstood the Lord in Exodus chapter 32. And let's read these verses. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with a great power and with a mighty hand? 
in the next verse. Why should the Egyptians speak? And he's reminding God of what God's purpose was. Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He brought them out to harm them. He killed them in the mountains to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Next verse. I want you to see what, what, he's, what he's doing. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. Cut one more verse or so, and then we're going to, I'm going to tell you what this is all about. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Now Moses was saying, Oh Lord, don't you know that you brought them out of Egypt not to kill them, but you brought them out to take them into the land of promise. And if you do not take them into the land of promise, if your purpose for saving them out of Egyptian bondage is not fulfilled, then the Egyptians and the heathen will rage and they will make fun of you, the Lord God. Sometimes I want to say to the Lord, Lord, you sent the pilgrims to the shores of the United States of America, the Mayflower Compact, to, may, to raise up a nation to the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. They made a compact, a covenant with you before they landed and before they got off that little boat. Do you remember that covenant, Lord? You cannot let this nation fail in its purpose or else the adversaries will say, there's what a Christian nation comes to. Are you listening to me? Look at that Christian nation. The world is watching us. The world is watching us. They're watching to see which way we're going to go right now. We're in the middle of a... a the, 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 the Christian faith that we hold so dear is under severe attack. They don't want Jesus mentioned. They don't want Jesus mentioned in any prayer. I remember when 9-11 happened. Our general overseer was invited to come to Washington, D.C. and lead a prayer vigil at Ground Zero. And uh, he was going to go excited about being invited to lead prayer there at Ground Zero. But they got him aside and said, Now you can come and pray, but the only thing is you cannot use the name of Jesus when you pray. And he said, No, thank you. If I can't pray in Jesus' name, I can't pray. Did you know that in the military, chaplains are forbidden from using the name of Jesus when they pray? They have to use the generic name God, which could be Allah, Buddha, or anything else. So we're in a time when they're out to stop the faith that is anchored in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So we need a revival. We need a revival among God's people because when you look at the church so much today, it's almost identical as what you see in the world. And when the same things are happening in the church that's happening outside the church, there's something needs to be done. We need a visitation from God that will make us clean up our lives and drop off those things that we've taken on that we ought not to have taken on. We get our families in order and our households in order. Get ourselves in the altar and bury our face before the Lord until the Lord comes down and visit us from on high. We need a revival which comes down from God out of heaven. It's when men turn their hearts to God and God is moved by the prayers and the petition and the repentance. That's when revival really comes and that's what we need right now in this land. So Moses was reminding the Lord, you brought them out for the purpose of delivering them into the land and then all the land was to be theirs. So if you killed them in the wilderness, the Egyptians and the adversaries that do not know you will say, he brought them out. But he couldn't get them in. Are you with me? God's name is Jehovah, which means the covenant God. The God who binds himself to men. Now, America has gone the same way as Israel has gone. We sin and ungodliness has, uh, has taken over many, so many people of our lives and so many of our principles by which we live. Our laws have been altered to try to legalize what God declares sin. Yes, yes. But I don't care how, how, how much you legalize, it's still sin in the sight of God. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die, the scripture says. So the government cannot make right what God declares wrong. That reminds me that I had to tell somebody not too long ago who were talking about the change in the marriage law so that uh, uh, men can marry men and women women. And I told them, don't you know that marriage precedes 
any other institution that's on this earth. The first thing God established was a marriage and home. And he calls a man and a woman to come together and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one, one flesh. God instituted marriage. We have no right, no authority in any way to redefine marriage. God's already established it. It's from God and we cannot change it. Amen. Amen. We're living in a time when they're trying to override and rule God out of everything. They don't want God's the symbolism of the cross, nativity scenes, or anything else that reminds them of Jesus Christ. It's not a Christmas tree, it's a holiday tree. You know what I want to say to people like that? If it's not a Christmas tree and if it's not Christmas, why are we celebrating? If, if, it's, if it's Christ's birthday, we're celebrating His birth. And if you don't want to celebrate, go on to work. But leave the rest of us alone while we celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into this world. I'm talking about America now. I mean, this is the theme that I want to get to you. We as Americans, we in the United States, have, have experienced some moves of God. Not one, but many. In fact... I've been doing a study on revivals. Elmer Towns, who's the great associate of Billy or of Jerry Falwell for years, who still uh, has written a lot of books, has done a, a book on revivals, and he 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 listed ten great revivals. And of course, he has his own. It, it, it's his his choice of the ten greatest revivals. And revival is uh, now let's just make a difference here you there there are times when local areas or a one specific area will have a move of God and and for a period of time things will happen I've I've had revival in my church and I know what's happened when the Lord visits uh, we went through a, I'll tell you what, what what will bring revival we went through a period of time that we were meeting at the church every night and we we started this with the idea of going two or three weeks and it ended up lasting three years Three years every night somebody was at that church praying and bombarding the throne of God and seeking God for our area. Many of those nights I was there. Some nights I couldn't be there because of other things, but the nights that I was there, it was during those times. Uh, when we first started, it felt like the heavens were brass. Uh, uh, for an hour, we would, uh, we would try to break through. And the second week, I'll never forget, on the Monday night, the second week, we went in there and we started to sing and worship the Lord for a moment, and it was like we punched a hole through the clouds. Hallelujah. And the glory of the Lord came down. And from that time on, we could be 30 seconds in that time of prayer and worship and the glory of the Lord. We, we broke through the heavens. We brought some light into that area and revival broke out in that church. And that's the reason why we had to build on more and build bigger because we outgrew what we had. But it all started in prayer. And during that time, the Lord began to open up scriptures to me that I'd never seen or understood before. One of them was, I was on the platform laying in, in, in front of the risers in the choir praying and, and the Lord said read Psalm 125 well it's not like Psalm 23 or some of those are, that, that are real familiar so I thought I have to I don't remember what Psalm 25 says and I began to read that passage and it, it, uh, down a couple of verses in it says the scepter or the, uh, which means the symbol of authority the scepter of wickedness shall not rule over the land allotted to the righteous lest they stretch forth their hand to do evil. And the Lord began to speak to me, it's time to say to the adversary, it's time to stand up and confront the enemy, this is not your land, this is not your family, these are not your kids, my family is not open to you. And we begin to reach out and pray and protect our children, protect our families, protect our church and pray over our area. And we begin to pray that prayer. In fact, we prayed about five prayers of agreement every night. Five things that we found in the scripture that the Lord told us we ought to pray for. And we prayed in agreement for those things every night. And we ended every night's prayer with a Shabbat of praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And it brought revival. But I'm talking about revival in a sense of, 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 reaching the, of touching the world. And the great revivals have been revivals that have happened simultaneously in different parts of the world at the same time. But there's one thing that is always characteristic of those kind of moves. It is because people are moved to seek the face of God. Every instance where there has been an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and revival has come that has affected the world, it's been preceded by people getting hungry for God 
in one move of God, in fact, just before the Civil War, there was a man by the name of Lampier who lived in New York City. And he started having a prayer meeting. He started out with just a few people. And they began to meet once, uh, uh, they began to meet, I think it seems to me, I think it was noontime. They would pray. And then it began to grow. And before you knew it, the whole city, New York City, was, was saturated with churches, people meeting in churches to pray. And that prayer meeting exploded into a national move of God. And, and there was a stirring of the heart. And, and listen to this. And it, and it created the environment for a man to be elected president by the name of Abraham Lincoln, who was a man of faith, who believed God. And it led to the Emancipation Proclamation, deliberate, the, the abolition of slavery in the United States of America. So it started out with somebody being moved. Somebody say moved. How many know God is the one who troubles you? It's God. It was God who, who impressed me. We need to have prayer every night. It, God begins to stir your heart and, and you start thinking of things that you haven't thought of and you start feeling things you haven't felt and you start waking up in the night and your mind's on the Lord and or the Lord begins to give you dreams. I had some dreams that, that I knew were not, not all dreams are spiritual. Most of mine aren't. It's too much pizza or something before I go to bed. But when the Lord gives you a dream with meaning, you know there's a difference in it. And the Lord started giving me these dreams and visions and I started finding myself prophesying. And God would do what I said because it came from Him. And I want to tell you something. that We need something like that to strike the church in America all across this land. We need a revival which comes from God because God moves our heart. We have experienced revival in the past. It's not anything new. Let me read you a description that, that Elmer Towns gives about when revival really comes. He says, when, when most people pray for revival, they're probably asking for a wonderful experience of church on Sunday at 11 a.m. But revival is more than a Sunday morning experience. When you pray for revival, you're asking God for a life-shaking experience that will cost you plenty. It's agonizing because in revival you become terrorized over your sin and you repent deeply. It's consuming because in revival you have no time for hobbies, for chores around the house, for work or for sleep. Revivals crash your daytimer, interrupt your TV time, demand your full attention, and wears you out. And usually when we pray for revival, we're telling God, sick them to the little man, to the bad man. But little do we realize that revival begins with us, the people of God. As a matter of fact, I've got a suggestion for you. He says, if you want revival, don't pray for revival. Just repent of all your known sin. Do everything you're supposed to do. Give God all not part of all your time and you will experience revival. When you get right with God, and God is right with you, then the glory of the Lord will come down upon you. And when the Lord begins to come into your life, He will expose things that you have hidden. He'll turn you inside out, upside down, turn you around and make you change the way you do things and the way you feel. And your whole life will be radically changed when God brings a true mean move of His Spirit into your midst. Yes, amen. That's what revival is all about. Now, let me go on. I haven't got to the heart of the text yet. We can only cry as the psalmist did. Lord, will you not revive us again? Revival is not affected by the severity of our prayer or our condition or how bad things are. It's released by the sincerity of our prayer. How, we, how true we are and what we, when we really mean what we say we, 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 we mean when we speak to him and we talk about him and we talk about his goodness. Acts 3.19 says that we ought to repent and be converted or change the way you're thinking. The word, that's what the word converted means. Repent and be converted or change your mindset so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord will come in His presence and fill our lives. But we have to start out with truly turning ourselves over to God and repenting of all the things that we know about. And I'll tell you what happens when you start repenting of the known things. There are some things that you've suppressed that will come to the surface. That you have excused yourself from will come to the surface. 
and you'll find yourself calling on God for that also. Now, let's identify the man who wrote these psalms, or this psalm. He's called one of the sons of Korah. Anybody remember that, recognize that name Korah from the scripture? These are people, this is a, a, this is a, a generation, or this, uh, actually there were, there's several places where there are seven generations of the sons of Korah named. All of them involved. Because these were of the tribe of Levi, the same tribe out of which Moses and Aaron came. And you remember the story of Korah. Uh, the, 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 he was one of those from the tribe of Levi that, that, uh, that helped Moses and, and uh, Aaron around the temple, around the tabernacle in the wilderness. In fact, they were the ones who would uh, uh, carry the tabernacle from place to place, set it up, take it down. They were the doorkeepers. They were the ones who prepared the instruments of worship. Some of them were singers and musicians who led worship in the house of the Lord. They were people that were intimately involved with God. That was the uh, sons of Korah, which was the tribe of Levi. But you remember the story that one day Korah rebelled against Moses and Aaron and said, why do you think only you're the only one that God speaks through? And Korah was brought before the presence of the Lord and 250 people came with him in rebellion against the authority of Moses and Aaron. And the Bible said that God said, bring your chalice of fire and bring it before me and let the priest have their uh, firebrands and we'll see who is in authority. And the Bible said the earth opened up and swallowed Korah. And the 250 of those who rebelled with him and the earth swallowed them up and the great fear came upon the people when they saw the power and the majesty and the sovereignty of God. But the scripture says, but the children of Korah did not die. But can you imagine how they looked to the rest of the nation being the children of this man who had openly rebelled against Moses and was consumed in judgment right before their eyes? Well, these are the same descendants, these the children of Korah. Their sons and their daughters became the, they became the leaders of worship in, in the tabernacle. I, 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 they, they became people that God used as doorkeepers. So somewhere along the way, they, they came back into favor with God. And God used them in a mighty way. You know, I don't know what background you have. But I have a feeling, how many of you have somebody in your background, your parents, your grandparents, somewhere along the way that knew the Lord and prayed and sought God? I knew it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a proclamation to make with me at the end of this message that, that can revolutionize your life and your family. The Bible teaches that, that we have such a, a place in God if we obey and walk with God and have God working in our life. We can pass on to our children blessing and we can cover them with a canopy and we can hedge them about with a wall of protection until they are assured that the word of the Lord will always be in their life. I found out that I had an uncle, a great uncle rather, that was a, that was a preacher. And, and then my, uh, my grandparents were, were, were dedicated Christians and helped charter church. And, and my dad was a pioneer preacher down in the hills of Kentucky for years and was shot at and, and all kinds of threats made against him. And they tried to blow up the church one time while he was in, in, inside. They put the dynamite under the building and lit the fuse. And when they went out after church and pulled it out, it burnt about that far from the cap and went off. Just quit burning. Uh, they did everything in the world to stop it. He was a pioneer preacher. He built churches. He raised up churches. He built buildings. And, and that was so I found out that I have a heritage all the way back for three generations. Now I have three children. I'm passing on the heritage to them. We're, we're going to have a we're going to have the Lord moving in our family. And I've been blessed, and my children have been blessed, and they will continue to be blessed because I believe we can pass on to our children the blessing that we have. But if we don't have it in our own life, how can we give it to those coming behind us? So these sons of Korah, and there's a number of psalms that they wrote. And, and it's interesting to me, I'm going to read you some of these verses from the psalms they wrote. Uh, they're, in, they're in order from starting with Psalm 42. Let's read some verses of what they said as uh, these were singers and worshipers. This was their heart. When you go back to their background, see where they came from. 
It was God who had to intervene in that family and bring them to where they would pray like this. For instance, Psalm 42, As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? That was their desire. My tears have been my food day and night while they continue to say, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with a multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept the pilgrim feast. He said, I'm remembering what you have done in the past, Lord. I want to come back again. I want to go again and rejoice before you, Lord. How long would it be before I can come and appear before you again? Psalm 43, 1 and 2. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Then the next uh, Psalm, Psalm uh, 44. Verses 1 to 4. We have heard with our ears, O God, our heart, our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days and days of old. We, you drove out the nations with your hand, uh, but you, them you planted. You affected the peoples and cast them out. For they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arms save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the strength and the light of your countenance because you favored them. You are my king, O God, command victories for Jacob. You see, that's the kind of praying I'm talking about. Relating to where we've come from. Knowing what God has already done in the past. I can stand here and tell you miracle after miracle that I've witnessed in my life. I can tell you of my own deliverance and my own miracle. I know what God can do and I know what he has done and God does not change and he will do it again in the name of Jesus he will. Amen. Psalm 45. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Get, gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and, with, and your majesty. He's praying to God now. And in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The, and the peoples fall under him. When we get, to, we get this communion going with God, we start commanding victories. Yeah. Did you know in the book of Job, the Bible said there's a place in God... Where when you pray, God will hear you, and God will answer you, and He said, you will decree a thing, and it shall come to pass. Yeah. There is a place in God where we as believers, when we have a true visitation of God, and true revival comes into our life, when we will go by those places that ought not to be there, that are destroying our children, and say in the name of Jesus, cease your operation, and God will bring it to pass, because He has given authority to us in His name to command victories for our people. Yeah. I'm talking about revival. Psalm 46, 1-5. to God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear even though the earth be removed. Listen to this. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river in the midst of all the shaking. And can you, can you see what's happening in, this, in the world today? Don't you see that the signs are in the heavens as the Bible said there would be? Signs in the moon, the sun, and the stars. Can't you see the storms and the earthquakes and the tornadoes and the, all the disasters that are happening around the world? Don't you see the uprising among the people? Revolution is spreading around the world and the, and the peoples are in mass upset and troubled and they're raging around the world. Do you see that? But the Bible said when all that begins to happen, there is still there is still a river who flows from the throne of God and fills the tabernacle of the Most High God and the joy of the Lord still comes into our midst. That's what revival is all about and that's what we need in our world today. No matter what is happening in the world out there, there is a river. And we need to get connected. We need to get connected to the river that flows. Now, God... Uh, wants, uh, he, we, we need to find faith. Faith with God. For a move of God. 
Uh, you have been favorable, the psalmist said in Psalm 85, which said another one of those psalms of Korah, the sons of Korah. You have already been favorable to your land. Let me give you a couple of examples of uh, what revival could mean in America. Did you know that uh, the Great Awakening of, of 1740, I, I don't know if people, it, it, the Lord brought this to my attention a couple of years ago, how so clearly that it was in 1740 uh, in Europe the churches were dead. The religion in, in Europe was controlled by the Church of England or the Catholic Church, and it was dead. The churches were largely not attended, and when they came, they were, there was no evangelism taking place. They were just whatever, whoever people, the few people that came to church, they, they, did, they went through their ritual and, and they had their, their religious form and that was it. And you know that, that they didn't have the freedom to worship God as they wanted to, so America was settled by those who were trying to escape the bondage that was going on in Egypt. And they brought uh, America, they brought the church to America and then they began to cool down and they were almost like it was their evangelism was not ex in existence. And there was an old Presbyterian preacher in New England, and his name was uh, Jonathan Edwards. He was almost totally blind. He, he wore real thick glasses, and he, was, he preached my manuscript. Everything was written out word for word, and because he couldn't hardly see, he would hold his manuscript up in front of his face so close so he could read it, and they couldn't even see his face. And he would read his manuscript sermons, and that's, that would be it. But Jonathan Edwards had an encounter with God. And when you read about that encounter, he was so overcome with the presence of God that the, he, he experienced a real conversion. In fact, it almost sounded like he fell out in the Spirit and he probably got full of the Holy Ghost. He just didn't know what it was. And he started, he went back to his church. He, he, he still preached by manuscript. And he still had his manuscript up in front of his eyes so they, could, they couldn't even see his face. He preached the same way that he had before. But suddenly there was a deep anointing upon him. And he began to preach those sermons. And people began to cry out and run to the altar and give their hearts to the Lord. And, uh, and, and, and revival broke out. It called, it, it called the Great Awakening. And in a, in a few months' time, 250,000 people on the Colonies up and down the East Coast got saved and turned their heart over to the Lord and revival broke out in America. Here's what happened. George Whitefield came from England and he was an outdoorsman. He was a preacher who had a powerful voice. He'd preach out in the open fields. Now remember, evangelism had stopped. They didn't have revivals. They didn't do anything like that. But George Whitefield came and joined up with Jonathan Edwards and a few more. And they began to have these outdoor meetings out in the fields. And hundreds of people got saved all up and down the East Coast. All the colonists experienced a mighty move of God. And revival came to America. For four years it raised to the colonies and people turned their hearts over to God. Things began to happen like mass evangelism, revival where people got saved and miracles of healing took place. And out of the Great Awakening, uh, missionary uh, uh, groups began to rise up and send people to the islands they could get to and take the gospel to them. Listen to this. Religion was dead. The Christian faith was dying until the Great Awakening happened right here in the United States of America. And the United States of America became the heart of Christianity. Because out of the Great Awakening, there were such things as the holiness movement, where people started recognizing sin again and, and preaching repentance from sin. And it revolutionized this country. It was in the spirit of the Great Awakening that America declared its independence. And when our documents were written in the, by the founding fathers, there's a mention of God in all of it. We believe that our, God, that our, 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 our rights are given to us by God, our Creator. Did you know in every, every state charter in this country, every one of them, there's a mention of God or, 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 or the divine provident one or some mention that, that refers to God in every one of our state charters state constitutions. So we say on paper, we say in our legal documents, we say it on our coins, in God we trust. We say it in the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God. 
We still say it legally. We say it's, in, it's written in the laws of our land. We believe in God. And that's the reason why the devil has fought us so hard because, because we believe in God and because we have experienced it. We are a nation because of a move of God. And God has sustained us and kept us. And when the Revolutionary War was fought, if you read the history of that, you know that miracles happened during the Revolutionary War to keep this country from going down in defeat and establish us as a nation. God was with us then. He wants to be with us now. I love my nation. I love my country. And I'm, I, I'm not ready to give it up yet. Amen? Amen? If God did it, then He can do it again. Things were low when God sent that revival. Let me give you one more great uh, experience of the move of God in America, and I'm going to close here pretty quick. In 1900, in the United States, it is believed that maybe there might, there might not have been anyone that, 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 was, that they knew of that was filled with the Holy Spirit. We do know the Church of God began in the, in the hills of North Carolina, Tennessee. In about 1886, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit at a Shearer schoolhouse. And some people spoke with other tongues, and, 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 and the Holy Spirit came. They didn't exactly know what it was, but it happened. But there was not a whole lot said about it. But you've heard of Azusa Street. It was said in, in the, uh, the new year, the first day of the year of 1901... In the middle of the country, somewhere around Kansas City, there was a, a prayer meeting going on, and a little lady received the Holy Spirit the first day of the year, 1901. And then Azusa Street broke out in California, and for years, they said in two years' time out of Azusa Street, five million people turned to the Lord. It started out in a house, in a Bible study, and then it, uh, it got so big that they moved into a, a stable, what used to be a stable, and converted it into a little sanctuary, and they had crates for a pulpit stand and seats to sit on, and that's where the Azusa Street Revival broke out, and people came from all over the world. And five million people in two years found the Lord. Here's what I want you to see. 1901, right in the middle of the nation, God dropped the Holy Spirit on this little lady, and out of that prayer meeting, the man who went to Azusa Street and took that revival went, went to the West. In 1886, on the East Coast, in North Carolina, Tennessee, the Holy Spirit fell on a group that is now the Church of God. So you have on the West Coast, Azusa Street. In the middle of the country, you have the uh, uh, Kansas City area where the Assemblies of God formed and became the mighty church and the great church that it is. And on the East Coast, the Church of God was formed as a result of what happened at Shearer Schoolhouse. So what God did, He started a fire out there, a fire in the middle, and a fire here. But guess what's happened since that time? It's burning together. It is estimated there's at least 750 million or possibly as many as a billion people full of the Holy Ghost. And it started one at a time, one in Kansas City, a group in, in Los Angeles, California, and a group in North Carolina, Tennessee Mountains. And now the world knows about the Pentecostal message. It was a move of God. We need another outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I've got to find a place to stop. We need another outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God wants to work in our midst. Here's what I want you to see. When revival comes, it is not confined to just one area because they found out that during, for instance, during the Great Awakening, not only was there revival happening here, but the Moravians, which was a group in Germany, received an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and revival broke out there. And there were two other places at least in the world where, where moves of God were taking place. Can I tell you something? This is my Father's world. He made the earth and He has never given it over to the devil yet. 
It is His world and He's going to redeem it. It is His earth. He made it for mankind. And if you want to know what's going to happen, read the end of the book. And you'll find out there's going to be a kingdom right here on this earth. And Jesus Christ is going to sit His throne in Jerusalem and reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And we as the righteous people of God are going to flourish in all of the earth. That's what God is going to do. So when I get discouraged, I'll read the end of the book. That's where we're headed. That's where we're going. God is not finished with us yet. In the revival of Azusa Street, while there was revival breaking out here, the Welsh revival in Europe was taking place. And in the Asia, in, in Korea, in 1900, there was not a single Christian church in Korea. Today, 35 to 40% of all Koreans are Christians. Did you hear me? When God invades His world, things will be turned upside down. We need a revival. A revival that begins with us. We can't vote it at the polls. We can't vote somebody in to bring revival. It's not going to come out of legislation passed by Congress. Revival is going to come when there's a connection between heaven and earth by people who get on their knees and seek the face of God. You know the scripture well. Second Chronicles 7, 14, If my people who are called by my name, for, listen to this, we miss this, it will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You've got to say it all. Then he said, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That's the order it has to follow. God will do it again and again if you and I want it in our lives. Come and help me with some music and I'm going to close. I want, I want you to do something with me. I was reading the book of Isaiah one day, Isaiah chapter 3. And it's not one of those inspirational chapters to read. Because it was God declaring what was about to happen to Israel because they had forsaken Him. Forgotten His covenant, turned away from His laws, had been unfaithful to Him in their idolatry. And, and, and there was a long string of what was going to happen. And then in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 10, this verse pops out of the Scripture. But say to the righteous, we put it on the front of our bulletin. Every Sunday it's there. But say to the righteous, it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Look, for, look it up in your Bible. Right in the middle of judgment. Right in the middle of all the things bad that's going to happen. And I want to say to America, and I want to say to the agnostics and the atheists and those who want to take God away and God who want God removed from our children's ears, don't want anything taught in school, no prayer in school, no, no Christian symbols anywhere. They're even trying to remove the crosses from the veterans in the, middle, in the cemeteries where our veterans have been buried. I want to say to them, do you know what the Bible says? Say to the righteous. No matter what you do, you can't stop the Lord from blessing me. No matter what laws you pass, you can't stop the Lord from taking care of me. No matter what laws you pass, and no matter what invasion you have into our personal life, which is now beginning to take place, I don't have to have your protection the Bible said the Lord will be a wall around me. And His, His glory will be my rear guard. Yes. He'll be a canopy of blessing over me. He'll be a hedge around me. He'll be surround me with, and He'll live and abide in my life. And you can't touch God's anointed and you can't do His prophet's harm if God wills against it. We're going to have to have some faith to stand on because we're about to be tested. We are about to be tested. Yes. Amen. Where is your faith? Say to the righteous, It shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. And then Isaiah chapter 59. It's an end time prophecy. Of, you've heard the, the, the verse that uh, talks about when the enemy shall come in like a flood. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. You've heard that verse. The next verse is what I want you to hear. Because I'm going to have this printed on one of those magnetic cards that you can put on your refrigerator because I know you're going to see the refrigerator pretty regularly. That's what I tell my folks. 
I know you're going to go there. And I want you to see this card. Here's what this verse says. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, God's people. The ones that He raised up a standard for us. The Redeemer who's going to come to our midst. He said, I, I, the, My Spirit who is upon you and my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants nor from the mouth of your descendants descendants says the Lord from this time and forevermore. Amen. My Spirit will not depart my words upon you, my promises will not depart for you, hallelujah, for your children. How many have children? For your grandchildren, I got six of them. How many got grandchildren? For your grandchildren. And if they take it and pass it on, they'll just keep going on on and on and on. This is God's word to us. We can have it if we want it. If we'll seek the Lord with all of our heart, His word will not depart from our family. His protective orders, His blessings will not depart. And His Spirit will be upon us forever until the very end. Stand with me if you would. Hallelujah. Say these words with me. I want, you to, I want you to get this one in your heart. Say to the righteous, Say to the righteous it, shall it shall be well with you, for you shall eat the fruit of your doings. You shall eat the fruit of your doings. In other words, you live right, you're going to be blessed. We're in critical financial times. They are now beginning to center in and focus on your pensions, your annuities, your savings to control them to where they will be used as the government wants them to be used. The dollar is near to collapse and if it does, your dollars will be worth pennies. So what are we going to do? We're going to trust the Lord. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. We need a move of God. That will cause us to stand up and begin to declare the promises of God, resist the evil that is before us, and claim for our families and our homes God's protective blessings given in His Word. Father, I pray right now that Your Word will be effective. Let it touch the heart of Your people, O oh God. Let people rise up in this place, Lord, and begin to declare Your blessing over their, home, of their homes and their families. Let their children be turned to You, O oh God. There are some who have wayward children here tonight, Lord. Some are in trouble. Some are struggling for their very existence. And I pray right now that the window of heaven will be opened over this church. The glory of the Lord will begin to settle in over this place. And this will be a house of blessing. That every family that is committed to this fellowship will experience revival among their children and their grandchildren, their brothers and their sisters. If you have anybody in your family that you know needs to be saved, that they're, they're having trouble right now, come up here and stand in front. If you can get here with me, we're going to believe God for a breakthrough for you and your family. Revival is not going to start on the outside. It's going to start right here. How many know God didn't save you to let your children be lost? He saved you to keep them safe. To put your protective, just filter around to the side so as many can get up as can. In the middle, come over to each side so we can get as many up front as we can. You see, you, you see what, what we have here? We are, we are people in need of a move of God. Amen? Yes. We need a move of God. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you've never really made a commitment of your life to the Lord, you're facing a world you can't handle without God. If you don't have God, you're going to be in trouble. If you need the Lord, I want you to come and stand up here with us. Let the Lord be the Lord of your life. Make Him the master of your life. Make Him the master of your life. That's it. Just keep coming. Praise God. We're going to speak, we're going to speak the word of the Lord and the blessing of God over you tonight. We're going to, we're going to pray the the blessing of God on your family and your home until you will experience a revival in your home. If everybody in here had a revival in their home, this area will be revolutionized. Yes. Amen. Yes. If your children got saved, your grandchildren turned to the Lord, we'll turn this place upside down for the kingdom of God. Yes. Lift your hands up right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, right now you see our hands lifted. Total surrender and submission to you. We want your purpose to be accomplished in us. We want your purpose to be accomplished in your church. 
We want your purpose to be accomplished in our state and in our land. We are a nation unto you. A constitution says we recognize you as the giver of all of our rights and our blessings and our benefits. In you we trust, O oh God, and we, do. we call upon you right now, Lord, to renew in us the fire of the Holy Spirit. As you moved in days gone by, you can move again, O oh God, as you have brought revival in all and other parts of the world. You can bring revival to here just now, Lord. Turn the hearts of your people to you, I pray right now. Let the Holy Spirit fall with might and with power. Lord, I pray that you, every child that's unsaved, if you have a child unsaved, call their name right now. In the name of Jesus, save those children who do not know you, Lord. Let the convicting power of the Holy Spirit go out, O oh Lord, and let the witness of their loved ones be so strong until they cannot escape, until they come and seek the Lord in the altar. In Jesus' name, let revival break out in our midst tonight, O oh God, in this church. Right here, O oh God, let there be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, worship the Lord now, everybody, in your own way. Worship the Lord and cry out to God. Call the name of your children and your grandchildren, your brothers and your sisters, your parents or whoever needs the Lord. Call their name and say in the name of Jesus, I declare them as believers. I decree over them an experience with God. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. God, in the name of Jesus, let revival come. Let this area experience a revival that will change their lives forever. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Let this church experience a move of God till it will reach more people than ever imagined. Release your anointing, oh God. Stay just a minute. Just stay just a minute. Don't be in a hurry. God's going to open your eyes. The Lord's going to give some of you an inspiration of what you need to do. You may have to go home and do some things. God, we're going to give you the idea of what you need to do. There may be something you have to do to release the favor of God, but you need the favor of God. Listen to Him right now. Father, give us insight. Give us wisdom. Give us direction. Oh, God, you look into every heart, every home, every family situation. Oh, God, there are keys there that will open up the doors and open up the windows of heaven over their lives. God, give your people instruction right now. Give them instruction right now. Oh, God, give them instruction as to what they need to do. Oh, God, right now, in the name of Jesus, we release your power, your anointing, your authority, oh, oh God, to touch this place. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. In you, Lord, we move, live, and move, and have our being, O oh God. In the Lord put I my trust, O oh God. I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge and my fortress, and my God in Him will I trust. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We bless your name. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Have your way right now, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Go home and go through your house and say, God, this is your house. Yes. These children are your children. My family is your family. Yes. And decree every one of them as believers. Declare over them God's favor. Yes. Don't ever condemn or judge them as being lost. Declare them as the believers until God brings them in. Amen. Hallelujah. I had a lady say to me, I had a lady say to me one time, if my daughter doesn't go to heaven and be over my prayers, if she goes to hell and be in spite of my prayers, I said, don't ever say your children will be lost. No. My children are going to be saved. 
Don't go with me to glory. Declare it over them in the name of Jesus. Walk through your house and anoint your house. Every door seal and window seal and just anoint it. Say, Lord, this is a place of peace and rest. And this is a place of salvation. Declare it, decree it. You have the right to do that. You're the one that needs to do that. Let your family know that you're praying for them. You expect them to be in heaven. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. I'm finished. Thank you so much for allowing me to give you my heart tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. A right now word from the Lord. Thank you, Brother Rubel. Feel very strongly about what I'm about to do and I have intentionally not said anything to any of our guest evangelists who have come about what's happening on Saturday morning 